In this video, we're going to talk about section 1.1 material, which is an introduction to systems of linear equations. In the video, you will link algebra and geometry of systems of equations and their solutions, apply elementary row operations to transform matrices into row echelon forms through a process called Gaussian elimination, determine solutions to systems of linear equations by hand and in maple, and classify linear systems as consistent or inconsistent. As part of her research, Dr. Sarah, who is a colleague of mine in the math department, studies the accomplishments and the challenges that face women and minorities in math. As part of her research, Dr. Sarah was able to interview Evelyn Boyd Granville, who is the second black woman we know of to receive a PhD in mathematics. Dr. Granville's original research was in complex analysis, but her research path brought her to work on space missions, including Project Mercury, the first human space flight. Of this, Dr. Granville said, this was the most interesting job of my lifetime, to be a member of a group responsible for writing computer programs to track the paths of vehicles in space. Dr. Granville was also interested in outreach, and one of her favorite outreach problems to work on with students was the following. Rabbits and chickens have been placed in a cage. You count 48 feet, and 17 heads. How many rabbits and chickens are in the cage? As we think about solving this problem, we need to introduce some variables. So we're asked about rabbits and chickens. So we need to give variables to those. Let's let x be the rabbits and y be the chickens. Our first step is going to be to express the problem as a system of linear equations. And in two variables, a linear equation is just a line. So we want to think of the equations for two lines that capture the story in this problem. And then Dr. Granville always asked her students to solve the problem using three different methods. And I really like that because it highlights how we have multiple ways of viewing things, multiple ways of attacking problems in mathematics. If we think about the heads in the problem, there are 17 total heads and each rabbit and each chicken only has one head. So X plus Y is 17. And then if we think about the feet, each rabbit has four feet, each chicken has two feet, so 4x plus 2y has to be the total number of feet, which is 48. So these are the two equations that the story told us must be true. As we solve the problem, we're looking for the solution set to those two equations. The points, the number of rabbits and chickens that satisfy both the first equation and the second equation simultaneously. Our first method is geometric. We can graph both equations and just look for their point of intersection. Our second method is that of substitution. We could take the first equation, solve it for x, x is 17 minus y, and then substitute that into the second equation and go from there. Our third method is elimination. And you have some experience with elimination methods from working with linear equations previously. If you've ever multiplied an equation all the way across by a constant or added two equations together, those are steps in elimination. And it ends up that the elimination method is the algebraic method that's most methodical and that makes it easier to expand to more variables and also to program if you're thinking about solving the problem using some kind of computer algebra system. And so for algebraic methods, we're going to stick to elimination as our method of algebraic solution. And we'll compare the elimination method, the algebraic methods, with the geometry of the situation quite frequently. So our class is going to focus on method one, geometry, and method three, elimination. Evelyn Boyd Granville's problem is written on the left. And then on the right, we just have a simplified version. So we call this an augmented matrix for a system of linear equations. Each equation is its own row. And then for the x's, their coefficients go in the first column, the y's coefficients go in the second column, and we have the answers in the third column. So it's easy to get from equations to augmented matrix, from augmented matrix to equation. It's just that the augmented matrix is less to write down. We're going to take that augmented matrix and put it in something called a row echelon form through a process called Gaussian elimination. This process of Gaussian elimination employs these three elementary row operations that you see on the screen now. And those elementary row operations will not change the solution set to the system. So any point that is a solution to the original system will also be a solution to the system that occurs after you've applied an elementary row operation. And if you're a solution after you applied an elementary row operation, you must have been a solution before. So the process of Gaussian elimination is just to apply these elementary row operations so that we get a simpler system that's easier to solve. The elementary row operations are replacement, 
you can replace one row by the sum of itself and a multiple of another row, like replacing row two with negative three times row one plus row two. You can interchange two rows, which is just switching the order that you're presenting the two equations. Or you could multiply an entire row by a non-zero constant, which is just taking the full equation that corresponds to that row and multiplying through both sides by the same non-zero constant. Then the process of Gaussian elimination for a two by two system would be take the first equation's x term and try to use that to get rid of the second equation's x term. And once you have the second equation x term gone, then that second equation is much easier to solve. And then you can back substitute to figure out what the first equation is. And we'll work through the whole process so that you can see the steps. Here is Evelyn Boyd Granville's problem about the rabbits and the chickens. And we want to use a replacement operation in order to get rid of the x term in our second equation. So in the augmented matrix, that corresponds to making that second row first entry a zero. We want to turn the four that we see there into a zero. And we're going to do that by a replacement operation. We're going to replace row two by the sum of itself and a multiple of another row. We'll do that by adding negative four times row one to row two and replacing row two. And there you see the notation for that move. And here we'll apply the operation. So I have two things to talk about in what I just displayed. First, notice that when we presented the augmented matrix initially, I had this vertical bar between the coefficient side and the answer side. And I've gotten rid of the vertical bar now. It's easier to type if you don't have the vertical bar. And sometimes your textbook will put the vertical bar in there and other times it won't. And some disciplines will always show the vertical bar and other disciplines never do. So just know that if you have an augmented matrix, the answers are the last column and the coefficients are everything but the last column. And I'm gonna try really hard to sometimes put the vertical bar in there and other times not so that you're really comfortable with augmented matrices presented with both notations. And then the next thing I wanted to point out is that as I'm applying this elementary row operation, I'm telling you what I'm doing. So I draw an arrow to say I'm applying an elementary row operation and I label it with the operation that I'm applying. So this label says the new row two is equal to negative four times row one plus row two. And that's really important for two different reasons. First, it helps you if you end up making a mistake along the way, then you know what, what you were trying to do each place and you can check more easily. And second, it makes your work readable and understandable to others. And to me, that's the most important reason that you should label your row operation. It's very much, if you're a computer science major, like commenting your code. It's just something that you should do so that others can understand the process. Now, if we apply that row operation, what does our second row become? It becomes zero, negative two, negative 20. And those numbers just came from taking negative four times row one and adding it to row two. So negative four times one plus four, that's the zero. Negative four times one plus two, that's the negative two. Negative four times 17 plus 48, that's the negative 20. Now we are in that upper triangular form, which is called a row echelon form, and we're able to go back to equations. So the first row translates to the equation x plus y is 17. And the second row translates to the equation 0x minus 2y equals negative 20. Well, now the second equation is really easy to solve. Negative 2y equals negative 20, so y equals 10. And then we can substitute that into the previous equation. That's a process we call back substitution to figure out what x is. And when we substitute y equals 10 into the first equation, we figure out that x equals 7. So 7 rabbits and 10 chickens is the answer to Evelyn Boyd Granville's challenge problem. We'll use Maple to explore this system a little bit more. And the purpose of using Maple on the system is, well, number one, you've already explored it by hand algebraically, and it's nice to be able to compare answers, but also it's a nice simple system that we can introduce the ideas for Maple so that you're more comfortable with the Maple commands when you really need them in order to solve more complicated systems that you might not want to attack by hand. 
This is the 11intro.mw file that was linked in the 1.1 introduction video assignment link on As You Learn. So you can download this Maple file and work through it with me. The first thing I wanted to point out is the, this first line of code here. It says with linear algebra colon with plots colon. And what happens is Maple has so many commands that it can't load them all when you open Maple or it would take forever. So if you're gonna use commands about linear algebra, you have to enter this with linear algebra command. And if you're gonna use plot commands, you have to enter this with plots command. You're calling these packages so that then Maple learns all of the commands in the packages. And just because it's typed doesn't mean Maple's read it in. So at the end of this line, put your cursor there and press enter. Now Maple has read in those commands and every single time I open up this file, no matter what I see, I have to go to the end of this line. This is with linear algebra with plots, put my cursor and press enter. Every time I open the file, I have to re-execute that line. Next, I wanna plot the two lines that are in Evelyn Boyd Granville's problem. Dr. Granville's problem had the lines x plus y equals 17 and four times x plus two times y equals 48. So notice that I had to use a times, an asterisk symbol, to let Maple know that I wanted four times x. And because there's a semicolon at the end of this line, when I push enter, I actually see the plot where the two lines are intersecting at that 0.710 that we had found previously. Next, I want to use the matrix version, the algebra version of solving the problem. So I need to enter the matrix into Maple. So here, I have to name my matrix. So I named it capital E, capital B, capital G. And Maple is case sensitive. So whenever I refer to this matrix, I have to use capital letters. Then I wanna tell Maple I am assigning a name and that's what the colon equals does. If I just did an equals, it would think I was typing an equation, but I'm not typing an equation. I'm assigning a name. So I need colon equals. So when I push enter, I see my matrix, my augmented matrix for the system. Then I'm using the Gaussian elimination command. I say do Gaussian elimination on Evelyn Boyd Granville. So that's what the parentheses EBG does. If I push enter at the end of that line, I see their Gaussian elimination form. And then another command that one might use is reduced row echelon form of Evelyn Boyd Granville. And what that does is it continues on with row operations until it gets to an equivalent system that is much easier to read off the solutions. When you translate back into equations, the system says x equals seven, y equals 10, which was the solution that we had found. And we'll talk more about reduced row echelon form in our section 1.2 introduction video. You can use the commands on the rest of this file to explore the other examples that you will see in this video. In our next example, we're gonna explore the solution sets to the following systems of linear equations and think about how the value of h affects the solution set. So here h is a coefficient, and we're thinking about if we have different values for h, different coefficients in that spot, how's that going to affect the solution set? My first step is to make an augmented matrix out of the system. So I take the first row has one for the x co coefficient, h for the y coefficient, and zero for the answer. And the second row has h for the x coefficient, one for the y coefficient and zero for the answer. So I've made my augmented matrix. And now I want to apply the a replacement elementary row operation to get rid of or to turn into zero the h that's in the second row first column. I'll use the elementary row operation replacing row two with negative h times row one plus row two. And then the second row becomes zero, negative h squared plus one, zero. And I'm ready to go back to equations. The second row's equation would be zero x plus negative h squared plus one times y equals zero. Now, how I solve that equation depends on whether negative h squared plus one is itself zero or not. So I kind of have two situations. If negative h squared plus one is not zero, then I can divide both sides by that non-zero number by negative h squared plus one and just get y equals zero. 
If y equals zero, then I can back substitute into the first row's equation, which is x plus h times y. So x plus h times zero equals zero. And that tells me that x equals zero as well. So the solution to the original system would be just zero, zero. We'd have that unique solution. But if negative h squared plus one were equal to zero, which happens when h is one or negative one, then the second row would be zero y equals zero. And it doesn't matter what y is. Zero times y is always equal to zero. So I get absolutely no information from that second row. And I have to go back to my first row, which tells me x plus h times y is zero. So x is negative h times y, which means that when h is positive one, x is negative y. And when h is negative one, x is positive y. So we have an infinite number of solutions in this case. In the situation where h equals positive 1, we get the infinite number of solutions that are all the points on the line x equals negative y. And when h is negative 1, we get the infinite number of solutions that is all of the points on the line x equals positive y. So we've seen systems where of two equations and two unknowns where there's a unique solution and where there's infinite number of solutions. And this slide is asking you to think about what are all the possible sizes for those solution sets of a linear system with two equations and two unknowns. And to try to think about an example of a linear system that has each of those possible sizes. And then also to think about why your set of possible sizes is it. There aren't any sizes besides the ones that are listed in your set. There are really only three different possible sizes for solution sets for systems of linear equations in general, not even just systems with two equations and two unknowns. You can have a unique solution, just one solution, then that would be like in Evelyn Boyd Granville's problem that we just looked at. In Dr. Granville's problem, we saw that there was just one point of intersection, and that would be the unique solution to this linear system. So that's the picture on the left on this slide. Now for the picture in the middle on this slide, we had two equations, x minus y equals zero and negative x plus y equals zero. But really, if you take the second equation and multiply it all the way across by negative one, you get the first equation. So really they're the same line. And so the two lines, they lie on top of each other. We have an infinite number of solutions. That's like our previous example when negative h squared plus one was equal to zero and we got an infinite number of solutions. In the third picture, the picture on the right, you see two parallel lines that are not coincidental. And so when we have two parallel lines that are not coincidental, we know from the Euclid's postulate that they don't intersect. There's no point of intersection. And therefore, there's no solution to the system of linear equations. And that's kind of why we have these three situations. If our lines are not parallel, then we know that they are going to intersect in a unique solution. If they are parallel, then either they can actually lie on top of each other, be the same line, and we'd have infinite solutions, or they could not lie on top of each other, and since they're parallel, have no solutions. And that's it. Those are the only possible situations. Two fundamental questions that we ask about linear systems, questions that we're asking ourselves the entire semester are, Existence. Is the system consistent? And what consistent means is, is there at least one solution? So could, is there a unique solution, infinitely many solutions? They both fall into consistent. No solution is called inconsistent. And if we have a consistent system, is that system, is that solution unique? Is there just one solution, a unique solution, or are there infinitely many solutions, which we know is the only other possibility? If we look back at the problems that we've already talked about, in the one on the left, which is Dr. Granville's problem, we have two lines that intersect in a unique point. That is a consistent system with a unique solution. In the picture on the middle, the two blue lines that are on top of each other, that's a consistent system with infinitely many solutions. And then in the picture on the right, the two parallel lines that are not on top of each other, that's an inconsistent system because there is no solution. We can have systems of linear equations in lots of variables. And what it means to be a linear equation in a set of variables is that you can write that equation in this following form, where the a's and the b's are just constants. They're real or complex numbers. So we need some 
number times x1 plus some number times x2 plus some number times xn equals answer, which is a number. So we don't have any squares. We don't have any square roots. We don't have any products of variables, just constant times variable plus constant times variable plus dot 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 constant times variable equals constant. So if we have a linear equation in three variables, I'm going to use the variables x, y, and z. Then we have constant times x plus constant times y plus constant times z equals constant. And if you're thinking graphically in three variables, which is three space, the space that we live in, a linear equation is a plane in three space, so a flat surface. Here is a picture of three different linear systems with three unknowns. Each plane represents one equation in our three equations in our system. How many solutions does each system have? So how many solutions are there for the system of three equations and three unknowns on the left? How many solutions are there for the system of three equations and three unknowns in the middle? How many solutions are there for the system of three equations and three unknowns on the right? For the system of equations on the left, you can see that the blue, orange, and gray planes intersect at a unique point. So there's a unique solution, just one solution. For the system of three planes in the middle, all the planes intersect along a common line, and there are an infinite number of points on that line. So there are infinite number of solutions. So something's really interesting here is that when we saw two equations and two unknowns, the only way to get an infinite number of solutions was to have the two lines that were our two equations lie on top of each other. But now that we're in three space, there's a lot more room for there to be an infinite number of solutions. We don't have to have all three planes lying on top of each other. In this case, the planes don't lie on top of each other, but they still intersect in a common line, and that gives us an infinite number of solutions. Similarly, on the right, we don't have any point that's on the blue plane, the gray plane, and the orange plane all at the same time. So there aren't any solutions. And when we had two equations and two unknowns, the only way for that to happen was to have parallel lines. But here, we don't have parallel planes. If we had three parallel planes, there would be no solution. But there are other ways for there to be no solution as well now. We have more space for things to happen. In this case, none of these planes are parallel, but there still isn't a point that's on all three planes at the same time. So there's no solution. We're going to practice using that same process of Gaussian elimination with back substitution to solve a system of three equations and three unknowns. The first step is to create the augmented matrix for the system. So the first row has the x coefficient for the first equation, the y coefficient for the first equation. So since there's no y term, that y coefficient is 0, the z coefficient for the first equation, and the answer for the first equation. And then we do the same thing for the second equation to give us our second row, and the same thing for the third equation to give us our third row. We're going to apply the same three elementary row operations and use the same kind of general process for Gaussian elimination. Take the x1 term in the first equation and use it to eliminate the x1 terms underneath it. Move on, take the x2 term in the second equation use it to eliminate the x2 terms underneath it, and so on until we get to that upper triangular form, which is row echelon form. On the left, you can see the augmented matrix that we have already talked about. So if I were applying strict Gaussian elimination, I would take a replacement operation to use the three in the first row, first column to, put, to turn the two that's underneath it and the one that's underneath that into zeros. But I hate fractions. And I know that in order to do that, I'm going to have to have a lot of fraction multiplication and addition. And I'd really like to be able to do the multiplication and addition in my head. And so before I start the strict process of Gaussian elimination, I'm going to use the interchange row operation so that I can get a one in that spot that drives everything, that first row, first column spot. So I'm interchanging the first row and the third row. Then I can get rid of, I can make the two turn into a zero by taking the row operation negative two row one plus row two replaces row two. And I can make the three in the third equation first column turn into a zero by taking negative three row one and adding that to row three to replace row three. Now I move on to that second row 
second column spot. Since the first column is taken care of, right? I've got my one at the top and zeros all underneath it. So now moving kind of down the diagonal, I'm at the second row, second column. I could again use fractions and get rid of things. But before I do that, before I go into strict Gaussian, I notice that that second row, those are all multiples of negative five. What if I multiplied the entire row by negative one fifth? I scaled it. Then I'd have a one again in my spot that's driving the situation. It would be easier to apply the row operation. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna scale. I'm gonna take the second row and replace it with negative one fifth times the second row. Now, to get rid of the negative six, that's the one that's underneath the one that we just created, I can take six times the second row, add it to the third row, and replace the third row. And now I'm in a situation where I'm upper triangular. If I look down the diagonal, everything underneath it is zeros, and I can go back to equations. Once I go back to equations, I see that that third equation is really easy to solve. It's just z equals three. Then I take that z equals three and substitute it into the second equation, and it tells me y equals negative one. So z equals three and y equals negative one, and I can substitute that into the first equation to get x equals two. So two, negative one, three is the unique solution to this system of linear equations. I wanted to point out again about how row operations preserve the solution set. So here we have two different equations that correspond to steps in our row reduction process. And you can see that the sets of equations are not identically the same because we've applied the row operation six row two plus row three replaces row three between the set of equations on the left and the set of equations on the right. The equations aren't the same and the graphs for the set of equations are not the same either, but the solution set is that point where the orange, gray, and blue planes intersect is exactly the same point in both of the graphs, even though the orange plane moves because of the row operation. But the solution set, its graph doesn't change. The system's graph changes, but the solution set, the graph that just at one point where they all intersect, that stays the same. So row operations preserve the solution set and they change the system of equations into one that's easier to solve. In example four, Suppose a system of equations has an augmented matrix that's row equivalent to that given below. What row equivalent means is that our original system can be transformed into this system by a set of row operations, by a set of elementary row operations. And we want to know, does the original system have unique solution? infinitely many solutions or no solution? And we can do that by deciding whether this system has a unique solution, infinitely many solutions or no solutions, because we know row equivalent systems have exactly the same solutions. In our last example, a system of equations has an augmented matrix that's row equivalent to the one given below. Is that system consistent or inconsistent? Remember, consistent means there is a solution, either a unique one or infinitely many, and inconsistent means there is no solution. This system looks almost the same as the one we saw before. It's just that the third row's answer is a three instead of a two. But look what happens when we apply the same row operation we did before. We replace row three with row two plus row three. But now our last row becomes zero, 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 one. And when we put that back into equations, that's zero X plus zero Y plus zero Z equals one. That's zero equals one. It doesn't matter what X, Y, and Z are. Zero is never equal to one. I call that the zero equals non-zero problem. And if you ever have the zero equals non-zero problem, you're in a situation where there is no solution. You have an inconsistent system. So that is the end of our discussion for section 1.1. And now you're ready to read section 1.1 to kind of see the textbooks discussion of these same ideas and then to do the practice quiz for section 1.1.